recorded and we will make the session and all of the webinars available on the tech.scot website. Um, some are already there from this week, but really give us to Monday and they should all be there by then. If you've joined us today and you haven't already done so, please do mute your microphone. Um, that really helps us to reduce any background noise, especially in the recording. I'd encourage you to use the chat to ask any questions or make any observations, type your questions in there and I'll keep an eye on it and pick them up with Margaret when the presentation part is complete. And also to encourage you to switch off your video. I know it's good to see everybody, but um, it can cause a bit of a issue with the recording at times and be a bit distracting. So I'm just uh, letting you see Margaret. <laughs> so Margaret can give us a wave um, before her camera will go off and we'll then focus on the presentation. Um, so I have the slides up. So hopefully you can see that the slides are all up there. Is that okay? You can see that? Yeah. I'm just going to mute myself and hand over to you, Margaret, if you just let me know when you want to go to the next slide. Okay, well, thanks uh, very much, Nessa. It's been a fantastic week of sessions. So well done you and all the participants. I think it really has been a great opportunity just to, to connect in, hear some of the work underway um, and, and reflect, as you say, in terms of uh, what that means for how we shape things going forward. Um, I also appreciate all of you joining on this beautiful sunny afternoon um, and I'm sure everybody's desperate to get a little bit of sunshine um, before the end of the day but uh, great to have you here and I, I, I'd really be keen you know to hear your views your experiences and you know in particular how we use uh, what we've been uh, supporting and doing over the last sort of 12 weeks or so really to shape uh, the sort of use of tech and, and digital in, in the way we, we support citizens um, in terms of their health and care. If, if you're having any difficulty with volume or anything, just uh, put, put a message in the, the message box and Nessa will, will alert me if required. Um, so I guess I have a number of slides, but I'm not planning really to, to do a, a readout of everything that's on the slides. The slides will be made available to you. I suppose what I really was doing was looking at almost a story of the past 12 weeks um, and I think because we're all working so so fast and, and so furiously, you know, it is sometimes hard to reflect. So actually in preparation for this and another session I did the other week, I think there's something about, you know, what, 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 what is going on and what are we learning? So I'm going to start really by just putting up a few slides that set a little bit of the context, because I think what's happened in the last 12 weeks is linked to what went before. Um, so in terms of tech, um, tech has been established now for five, five years or so, building on obviously earlier work that was progressed by um, SCTT in particular, but also other partners. And I guess the, there were four key areas that we looked at in terms of rationale. One was about creating the conditions to look at how we support deployment and growth. Um, and that was done in part through dedicated funding to local organizations, as well as some national work. Um, and I guess the aim was to facilitate that scale up and transition to mainstream. The second, which you know, I absolutely believe is, is fundamental to the way we, we have worked and the way we need to work is cross-sector leadership and collaboration. So from, from, from the start, we ha have had a cross-sector board, you know, including uh, representatives across health, social care, housing, you know, third sector, and I think that's been absolutely key in how we try and look at the, the way citizens want to be supported and the way they live their lives. So um, that, that's been from the board level, you know, through to the way we've worked uh, as, as, a, as a tech team and through the way I think we've worked with local partnerships and how local partnerships have also worked with, with, with their partners and stakeholders. The third one, I think, was one that really evolved after the first year or two of tech. So in the first, in the early days of tech, um, there was funding, um, guidance was issued, and we had lots and lots of uh, projects and initiatives going on. As somebody said, you know, a thousand flowers blooming. Um, and I think that was the right thing to do. I think that got interest, it got engagement, it got ideas. I think through the support then to sort of work with some of those and build them up. Um, we moved in the second phase of tech really into looking at a once for Scotland approach where that was relevant, where we could develop something, support something, um, let it be contextualized locally, 
but you know try try and, and make sure that we, we, we maximize what we can do in Scotland. And the fourth one is about again the cross-sector excellence and expertise so I think that's um, represented at the national level but I think also at local level I think where we're really seeing you know some fantastic work being done through some of our housing associations our third sector you know our independent care sector as well as our statutory sector so I think that's uh, been a key aspect as well okay next slide Nessa we had, a, we've had, we've had a number of evaluations of tech both in terms of some of the program specific evaluations um, but this one that, that just is, is referenced here was uh, an evaluation that was undertaken really across the tech program by an organization um, known as Just Economics and that was published in May 2018. And I, and I guess what that highlighted was that um, the, the benefits of having a national program um, that has some funding, um, has, has, has an ability to to work with stakeholders in driving um, programs of work, but also looking at addressing barriers to adoption. Um, and I think we we recognised as as we were working um, that this this approach really evolved and developed. Um, we didn't we didn't I suppose have a template that we were following, but I think the uh, evaluation I guess reinforced what we were doing. It did also draw up some areas that, that could be improved on and, and developed so um that that i think has been has been relevant um next slide nessa so I'm, I'm i'm telling a story of the last 12 weeks so um march seems a long time ago now um but uh, towards the end of february we took our tech delivery plan to our board and that was to get sign off for our uh, commitments and deliverables for 2021 um, that obviously was building on the strategy that had been set a few years earlier and absolutely located within the priorities set out in the digital health and care strategy published just over two years as well. So we've done a lot of work, we, we set out our stall, we got good engagement from stakeholders and the board in terms of, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's our plan and our programme. So as I say, that, that was a short 10 or 12 weeks away. So what I'm going to do is just touch on some of the areas in terms of what we set out to do and what's been actually happening and then draw maybe on, on some of the the learning from that um so on video consulting um this is building on the work we've been doing on attend anywhere for the previous uh, couple of years which was still relatively small scale um we had some areas like highland uh, in particular and probably grampian who were doing a bit more focused on a number of secondary care pathways so our, our aim for 2021 was that we would reach um, 3,000 consultations a month by, by March 2021. We would expand and work with, with uh, partners to um, focus on primary care, um, which had very little focus to date. And we would also look to see how we can expand and do some work with social care and continue to work with secondary care. So that's that's what we set out. Uh, we had a good plan to support delivery on that. Um, and uh, we were aiming for a digital first approach with at least 10% of consultations being undertaken by video. That We weren't saying that ambition we met in a year, but that was our stretch ambition. Okay, so that's where we were 10 or 12 weeks ago. So next slide, Nessa. Next, yeah. So this is a, this is a graph and, and it's, it's slightly, you, you need to look at this because um, the first part of the graph is looking at quarters rather than weeks. So if, if we did have it by weeks, clearly it would be a much bigger graph and uh, you would see a much more accelerated growth. But I'm going to just draw your attention really to the last 10 or 12 weeks. So in the beginning of March, we had about 300 consultations a week using um, the Attend Anywhere platform, but the program is, is known as Near Me. And by the end of last week, we had over 14,000 consultations in one week. So you, if you remember what I said just earlier, we were aiming for 3,000 consultations a month um, when we signed off our delivery plan at the end of, um, of February. Um, so clearly uh, there's been huge, significant, rapid scale up of near me and I'll, I'll reflect on 
you know, some of the reasons why that, that, that's, that's happened in, in, in that way. So as I say, I'm going to touch just on some of our programs and give you an indication of where we were at and, and where we're now at. So the next slide, Nessa. So remote, remote health monitoring, again, we've had a program of work around our home and uh, mobile monitoring for a number of years. We have had our Scale Up BP program, which has been our um, main Scale Up program covering um, almost all board areas, um, all bar three, three or four have been involved in our Scale Up BP. Um, we had set out uh, work on procurement that we would uh, procure, procure um, a new digital solution um, into the end of 20, uh, beginning of 2021. And we'd look to develop some work in, in other areas. Um, and again, our, our sort of numeric target was we'd have at least 20,000 more citizens benefiting by 2021. And we'd hopefully have, um, you know, the majority of GP practices offering some health monitoring. Okay, next slide, Nessa. So what's happened with remote monitoring? Initially, we had sort of assumed that we would continue to try and support the scale up BP, but recognize that that may not be a number one priority for um, primary care services, given that they were having to reorganize themselves in terms of responding to COVID in those early weeks. Um, but, but relatively soon, we recognized a need to, 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 to review the learning we had from remote monitoring and see is there anything we can do in addition to what we had set out to do that could support the immediate situation around COVID, but uh, also the, the non-COVID patients who are at high and medium risk um, over, the, over the coming months in particular. So we convened a, a range of stakeholders drawing on some of our existing um, sort of governance and program arrangements. And we worked closely with Digital Health and Care Institute and we developed, um, I suppose, a requirements about having a remote monitoring solution that could support COVID patients who were as ha were, 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 had symptoms. Um, the, the, the assessment may have been, well, we, we would rather not admit this person to hospital, so can we support this person at home? Um, but we want to be able to monitor their symptoms so there can be early intervention if as we know with COVID, people can deteriorate very, very quickly. Also possibly to support early discharge from hospital. As you know, a number of weeks ago, there was real concern that the, the hospital service would, would be on its knees. So there was a, a need to try and, um, if people were admitted to hospital, to try and be able to discharge them timely. And also there were plans um, to have step down beds for COVID patients. We, we've had the, you know, the, obviously the big uh, Louisa Jordan Hospital in Glasgow, which thankfully hasn't been required to be used. Um, and there was also going to be step down beds at um, the Golden Jubilee in what uh, is, is the Beardmore Hotel part of it. Um, but also I think a recognition that as we have this long tail in uh, the recovery back from normal services, there going to, there's going to be a degree or quite a bit essentially of unmet needs. There's also going to be patients who are um, shielding who are at high risk so trying to keep them out of clinics out of hospitals is going to be uh, clearly important and as we all have have seen over over the the, the weeks um the focus on care homes um you know i think that that maybe caught us all out to some extent um so just go back to that slide a second Nessa, um before i move on to telecare so just to describe what we've done then um, ha having identified um, some requirements, uh, we went about a very quick procurement. So within the, the context of COVID, we're, you're able to use a, an emergency procurement. And we did that for um, renewing the Attend Anywhere platform also and extending it. So we, we did that piece of work, did, did uh, you know, a good bit of due diligence in a very, very short uh, pace of time. And we have procured um, in-health care. Um, just in the last two weeks and uh, they're actively now beginning to work with us and we're in we're engaging with with all uh, boards and, and and stakeholders about how we can use this um, that's both to look at a COVID pathway and, and and the good news is obviously the number of COVID patients has been decreasing um, quite significantly but we also have to be prepared for uh, COVID being around for a long time to come and we may have peaks and troughs in that where 
um, we need to have a, a quick and ready response. We also did explore um, Florence in terms of the existing technology and there's some testing of change work going on in Highland around that, um, uh, around the protocol. Um, and in healthcare is also going to be able to support the non-COVID patient work as well. And we've got some priority groups that we're continuing to use Florence for and maternity services are, are one group um, that, that, that's been identified. So again, some work is going on um, to support uh, maternity patients uh, using Florence. So we haven't got the numbers um, identified yet and what that's going to look like in terms of recruitment to this, but I think we've done a lot of work very, very quickly to have available tools and approaches that can support um, both COVID, post-COVID and uh, a range of non-COVID um, patients. And that work, as I say, is, is really kicking off in terms of implementation. Okay, next slide, Nessa. On, on our telecare front, again, we've had a, a program of work underway for, for a number of years. A big focus is on the analog to digital transition. We had been doing work on call handling. We had a number of uh, reports that were published and, and there were recommendations flowing out of that. Um, and they you were know, looking at a range of uh, developments um, with, with, with partnerships. Um, next slide, Nessa. So again, with telecare, I think we recognised there was a need to refocus our work. Um, so there was a pause in, in, in some work, but there was a, a prioritisation and a, a refocus and a, an advisory group was established. And a number of key priorities have evolved from that. Um, one was on a uh, service continuity plan. Um, we issued guidance in March. We did expect um, that there might be a significant increase in demand for telecare as people were being discharged from hospital um, in terms of addressing the delayed discharge issue um, and actually that hasn't come to pass and, and I, I think we're, we're not 100% sure why that is. Um, I think part of it may be accounted for a, a risk averse approach of families um, not wanting um, people coming into their homes to install telecare devices. I think also we've seen a, a number of people who might have gone home to live on their own have either moved in with family members or family members have moved in with them. Um, because of the, um, the, the, the lockdown. So there's obviously a number of factors there, but there was some preparatory work done to ensure that there was an ability for local areas to respond um, with installations if that was required. Um, there's also uh, been work done with community of practice uh, and, and a lot of drop-in sessions, which I think have been really, really important. And, and coming out of those have been a, a couple of areas. So one is about the opportunity which was again in our plan, but we hadn't um, planned to, to do it as quickly as we are. But, but looking at proactive telecare um, and outbound calling, where uh, you can use the call handlers that are in place to respond to reactive calls to do some proactive calls to telecare users. Uh, and again, I know there's a number of other initiatives around, um, but it, it's trying to look at what, what's the added value of this. And also there's a specific piece of work being done on remote working and a test of change in progress and a particular strand of work around um, people with dementia. So we're still working to support partnerships in that digital transition, but within the COVID and post-COVID context, looking to see can we accelerate some of the planning and work we had underway. Okay, the next slide, Nessa. So this is digital mental health, um, which has always been in the tech program, but has been in specifically around CCBT, which is computerized cognitive behavioral therapy, um, which is already available uh, to, to, to all boards. But there was a plan to do some additional um, programs, one on uh, a, a sort of add on to CCBT that would uh, provide uh, for people with long term conditions and internet enabled CBT, which is uh, where there's um, a, a therapist at the other end. So it's, 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 it's not um, just the person working with a, a program, there is um, a, a therapist at the end and also um, sort of self-help at work. So there was a plan set out to, to do uh, work in this area and uh, various time scales that were probably between one and two years to, to implement this. The next slide, Nessa. Um, so this is just showing you a model of uh, resources that are being put in place, you know, going from mild and prevention into severe and enduring. And 
we've managed again to uh, procure um, both the extended CCBT program and the internet enabled um, CBT that probably would have taken us six to nine months in a matter of weeks. And a whole range of resources now are available um, for citizens with, with also a big focus on resources for staff. And um, again, an, an increasing uh, recognition um, that we need to be able to support um, staff who are working at the front line in terms of, of their mental health and well-being. So again, that's seen a very significant acceleration of work that we would have probably taken us a year or two to, to implement um, being, being uh, set up to, to scale up. Okay, the next slide, Nessa. There's also, we've also seen some new work that wasn't in that delivery plan um, in, in February. So one uh, recent area of work has been care homes. So I, I've been asked with, with, with um, colleagues to develop a sort of strategy, a digital strategy for care homes, building on some work already underway, but really looking at what are the priorities in terms of supporting care homes um, in, in, in the medium to long term as well as the short term. We've seen an expansion of interest in digital approaches and asynchronous appointments have been around probably for, for a while, but again, an increasing focus on how much can be done remotely. Uh, and that will include where information or um, photographs or videos are provided um, separate to a, an actual face-to-face -face or an online appointment, but information that clinicians and staff can use to inform a, uh, a consultation, whether a consultation is needed or uh, needs to be accelerated. Um, so again, we're, we, we're doing work right now to look at how we align this interest and work underway around asynchronous appointments and remote monitoring. And the third area to flag up is our Connecting Scotland programme. Now, I don't know if people are aware of Connecting Scotland programme. It was initially called Nobody Left Behind, and it was something that was initiated by Kat McCauley and the Digital Directorate, again, in the early weeks of COVID, when we were all struggling, I suppose, to work out what this was going to mean for us both personally, but also in terms of the work we do. And Kat's call for action was that there are, um, I think, 300,000 uh, people in Scotland who are not digitally connected, either through not having the right device or not having um, you know, internet access or data. So the concern was that as we push a lot of, not just health and care, but a lot of other services into digital channels, we're at real risk of having um, a, a significant proportion of, of, of a vulnerable population excluded from that. So the Connecting Scotland programme has been launched. There's been initially five million pounds assigned to it, which largely is going to be into providing devices and data um, to initially 5,000 people. Um, it's, it's been administered through local authorities with SCVO working very much in partnership. But from a tech perspective, we're recognizing that we have a real need to ensure that as we're, we're pushing um, near me and remote monitoring, that we do look to see how we work with Connecting Scotland to identify those people that hitherto might not have been using digital means and how we can you know, test that out and ensure that we can support that. Okay, next slide, Nessa. So this is really where I was making some reflections on what's made the difference. So in terms of where we were 12 weeks ago and, and what's happened, um, what's made the difference? Well, the first thing that's made a difference is digital interventions are now seen as of critical importance and necessity, both as part of the emergency response to COVID, but, really importantly to recovery and renewal. So I've often said that um, we have a lot of good work going on in tech and digital, we have lots of evidence, but it still feels it's in the nice to do box. Whereas what's happened with COVID, it's absolutely moved into that criticality of we must do it. This has to be part of how we uh, redesign um, services and support going forward. The second point, I think from the tech perspective, we had a clear strategy and a plan and we had a direction of travel that had been developed with stakeholders over the last um, four or five years. We had a set of priorities and those have stood firm in the context of what I've described in COVID and I think have allowed us to really mobilise 
and scale up uh, at a much faster pace than we would maybe have uh, initially planned for. And that's been around, I think, the investment in, in, in uh, funding and capability within local partnerships, um, training, um, support. I think we've, we've had a big commitment to evaluation and evidence. And, and back to that first point I had in the rationale for tech about creating the conditions both nationally and locally um, to be able to uh, deploy appropriate technology and digital. The fourth point is, is our ability to have been able to speedily procure. Um, so as I said, we, 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 ha we were about to um, we were about to work uh, probably a six or nine month piece of work to look at the re-procurement of um, a video consulting license. Um, however, we were able to do a very speedy procurement because of the criticality uh, and, and were able to uh, re-procure attend anywhere, but, but with much more, more um, capability. Um, in, in, in terms of what we were requiring. And as I say, we also did a speedy procurement around remote monitoring, which uh, I think again has, has been able to let us motor very quickly. The next slide, Nessa. The slide, slide stuck. <laughs> Sorry, the next slide. Yeah. Uh, no. Sorry. No, there's one one before it. I think it must have. Yeah. That one. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yep. So um, yeah. So so again, mobilisation of the tech cross sector capability and resources. You know, the national leadership and engagement. I think that you know has been a feature of tech, and I think that allowed us to really mobilise and in, in you know use our network at national level and at local level, and I I, I think has allowed us to to do what, what's been done over the last few weeks. Um, I think there's been real good local leadership and delivery with real focus. So again, some of that have been uh, there due to the work we've done to date. Um, interestingly, while we've had collaborations uh, across a whole range of delivery partners, I think what happened in COVID was, for example, with the scale up of Near Me, Health Improvement Scotland were able to redirect very significant staff capacity across their normal portfolios of work around primary care to really work with us on um, doing that front end work with uh, primary care and some of our secondary care specialties around that process change. So it's not just about making sure the kits in every place. And there was a lot of work done to do that. It was actually about some of the process change. And with Near Me in particular, there was some very good work done on public awareness. And we've got the Near Me website. Um, so I think there was a, a fair bit of investment in, in work on comms and, and awareness. And I think also the last point there, accountability. I mean, tech's always been accountable and um, we've had our board and I've been reporting through um, obviously Scottish government, but there's been much more um, immediate accountability for what we're doing. So we've been given a fair degree of permission to, um, to go forth and uh, deploy and, and uh, accelerate what we're doing. But there's also good accountability again where we're getting decisions made quickly we're getting endorsement for what we want to do we've got cabinet secretary getting daily briefings and you know i think that that that's really again facilitated i think the, the change okay final slide nessa so i suppose I, I i i've told a bit of the story in terms of, of what's happened where we were 10 or 12 weeks ago what's been happening in the meantime what i think have been some of the reasons for why we've been able to do what we do. It's not without its challenges, without its risks. And I think uh, we do need to now move into how do we shape the new normal? How do we just stay, sustain and build progress so we don't go back to status quo? Um, how do we engage citizens more? So citizens have had to engage more with digital for all, you know, we've all been doing it for personal um, reasons in terms of how we communicate and engage with our family and friends, but. Clearly, if you phone a GP today, you're, you're going to get a telephone uh, appointment as, as, the first, as the first port to call. Um, so we, we're not doing the, we're not, we're not phoning up, getting our appointments, waiting three or four days, turning up in the surgery, you know, for a five or 10 minute appointment. Um, so I think we've, we've all learned as citizens to engage with, with health and care services differently. And I think critically staff and clinical engagement uh, again, um, how we sustain and, and, and support that. Um, that. That's not everything. It was really just a, a few things that I thought might facilitate some, 
some initial discussion. Um, so that's me. Happy to hear views and. Thanks, Margaret. That's great. Thanks very much. Um, I, I've, if uh, people will bear with me, I'll give a couple of um, quick points and just a general reflection from the week of webinars and things that have come up repeatedly. Um, and really, they, unsurprisingly, they echo most of the things you've covered. Um, so again and again and again, we've heard about um, the importance of collaboration and having relationships that you already had in place and building on them, but also developing new relationships that work across the boundaries that we all have to deal with um, and feeling that there's much more of a consensus and a kind of willingness to work together to do things quickly. Um, a couple of points that came up in individual webinars were about procurement and the speedy procurement process, but also the session we had around um, information governance and rapid reviews came up and the ability to not avoid that issue, but do it, do it quickly, but do it and do it well. Um, and also another point that's come up, which you would expect me to say was um, the, the ability to learn from one another and just have a few minutes to actually pause and reflect. And, and if, if there's anything that this week hopefully has done is, is that um, think about what's actually working and have a few moments to actually think about that. That's hopefully been helpful. Um, the other thing I would say, um, we had a great webinar with the Scottish Social Services Council, which a lot of NHS people and, and housing and voluntary sector uh, colleagues attended as well as local authorities. And the appetite for digital learning and the requirement to produce um, online content or turn content into digital learning um, is obviously very big at the moment and that's going to grow. And I think that will feed into the discussions around recovery and rehab and, and all kinds of areas and just education and support for staff generally. Um, so I think that's going to, to go on um, and become more of a, a challenge, but also a real opportunity. Um, so I'm just going to have a quick look at the chat if anybody has additional questions that they want to add in or you can unmute yourself if you want to join in the conversation so bear with me for a moment. I see I see Jim uh, Ferguson has, has posted a comment which is about thoughts on driving forward and consolidating you know tech and digital in the new reality so I would be really interested in in people's sort of views on that. I don't know Jim have you got any particular thoughts on what yeah. Hi Margaret, can you hear me okay yeah? Yes, yeah. Okay, no it's just that I, I'm just thinking you know you know I, I was saying in one of the webinars yesterday you know penicillin was only produced when we had a, uh, the world war even though it had been invent, discovered in 1929 and it's taken a pandemic to push this forward and it's just you know, two years ago, the, we had that cross-party document that basically said, just get on and do this. And m my concern is how we actually in enforce the usage of this, which is too strong a word. But, you know, we have come up in the past with best guidance that you should be using um, technology as your first, you know, line for it, um, what you call it, um, consultations, and that way when it's appropriate. I think we're still going to have to have some sort of central direction or some sort of way of either coming up with practice guidelines or good guidance that, that actually drives this home uh, as we come out of the pandemic, but th that's just me, and I would say that. Thanks, Ferg. Margaret, did you have anything else to add on that? I suppose I'd be interested to hear on, on other thoughts. I mean, I think it's that bit I said about nice to do or must do. And I think there, I think we're moving towards, you know, stronger um, mandating, I guess. And I mean, I've heard a couple of examples that um, in one of the health boards, medical director um, has said that, you know, issued, issued a sort of a mandate really to, to clinicians and staff that, you know, remote um, consultation for out, resuming outpatients should be the the first um, the first uh, sort of port of call, and it's only if you know it's viewed that you absolutely you know cannot do what you need to do in a in a remote maybe be it you know asynchronous um, VC or a combination of all uh, that you would you would uh, resort to a face to face. Now again, I I guess the proof would be in the pudding about how that's. How that's applied and implemented um but I, I i i think i'm not saying it isn't still a challenge jim and i think there probably still will be you know sort of some 
staff resistance, you know, because the status quo is so powerful and we all, we all want to get back to this, you know, we all, we all are drawn to a status quo. Um, I, I guess for me, the likelihood is that we're going to be in, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're not going to get back to, to our old normal um, in, in the way that maybe we thought we were a few months ago, um, that we'd have this emergency, we'd all have to adapt our lifestyles, but actually we'd all get back and do more or less what we're doing. That You know, the view is that this is a, a relatively medium term um, situation we're in and, uh, you know that that, that that sort of requirement is going to I think push the need to change things much more significantly and and hopefully sustain those but I'm not saying it's going to be easy and, and I think you know the, there is a risk that some of the work that we've seen progressing over recent weeks you know may not be sustained um, there, 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 it, it, with near me I think looking at the um, as I said we had that great graph where we're getting numbers going up week on week primary care is sort of um, it's flatlined really over the last sort of three or four weeks um, and, and I guess there's, there's some some reasons for that some may be that you know I know primary care are doing most of their work through telephone and they haven't resumed normal business where they might be reviewing you know people with long-term conditions and medication reviews and all of that that uh, would be the normal uh, work that they would do um, there is still some issues about easy access to equipment so while we can say that almost all GP practices are equipped to do a near me consultation. It's not sitting on the GP's desk or the community health professional's desk um, or, or remotely. So they have to either go into another room to do a near me appointment. So therefore it's, it's, adding, it's adding another, another, um, a, another tier to it. Um, and you know, so, so, so I think there's a number of reasons maybe why, but, but I, I guess we do have to not be complacent in any way. But yeah, just inter interested in other, other other thoughts on that or people's own experience in, in their own health or social care um, context? I'll just chip in again that this is Nessa to say that uh, we just had we had a comment from Lynn in um, Ayrshire and Aaron uh, Lynn is with Empower um, just saying that the tech and the new the way of working with tech um, is very much part of what they're doing it's a new reality um, and the beneficiaries are over 65 years of age for people who are not familiar with Empower um, and mainly will struggle with tech. So they're keen to adopt tech approaches um, that have absolute ultimate user friendliness, that's a good way to put it, um, and require minimum user interaction. Um, just going back to, to the point generally about staff and, and engagement, um, and there are a few people on who could, I'm sure, answer this better than I would, but I would just also make the point that, you know, we heard in some of the webinars earlier in the week, and we know this, don't we, from, from digital health and care, that you, you, you almost have to keep going back over things um, and going back to people who maybe were resistant or did not see it as having a place in their workflow and their work pattern. And it, it may not have a place everywhere, but you have to keep going back to people. And I would also suggest that the... The webinars which are hosted by NES um, directly targeted at the nursing midwifery allied health professionals. Um, there was a whole host of them specifically around AHPs for a while and then they broadened out. They've been fantastically well received to be massive, you know, attendance, viewership, or however you describe that, um, about they're more of a training and education tool. So um, I think I don't for a minute um, disagree that there are going to be challenges to change the way people work, but it, it is about the way people work more than I think it's about the technology. Um, so I'm just checking to see if there are any other comments in. Anybody else want to unmute and make any comments or questions? Yeah, I mean, I suppose I would be interested yeah, in, in, in just picking up on Ferg's point. I mean, is there anything, you know, we need to be doing uh, more at national level? Okay. Uh, I know the boards have been asked to do the mobilisation plans. Obviously, something similar is happening within local authorities. Um, so digital, we expect, will be referenced there. I mean, it may be quite generally referenced. Um, but just is there any other examples either where people, I mean, we've got the Emperor example of, of, of really adopting it. I mean, Fer giving an example where it could have worked, but there was a bit of resistance maybe to, to it. Um, but, you know, are there other examples, either of barriers that we need to be addressing 
um, locally or solutions or, or um, areas where people have made real progress that we should be learning from. Margaret, I think Leslie wanted to come in. Leslie, did you want to come in? You've unmuted. Um, hello. Um, Margaret, the question I have is that for staff and the citizens, I think it'd be really helpful if there was, you know, an infographic, an overview of face-to-face, -face, using the internet, over the phone, near me, pharmacy first. I think it's partly not holding the whole thing. Yeah. And I think if we had it in both citizens and staff, more citizens would be asking for the digital and relaxing that when they needed the face-to-face -face more, that's also there. What do you think? Well, it's a very good point and it's something we've been giving some thought to and I've seen various infographics at various sort of, you know, meetings and things where people are trying to describe, you know, some, some aspects of, you know, face-to-face, -face, you know, um, asynchronous remote monitoring, you know, support to people's home and, and, and I mean, there's also all the technology, the, the everyday technology people have in their own houses, you know, that um, again with the in-healthcare model that uh, we've procured with, I mean, Alexa can work with that. I'm not sure exactly how that's going to translate, but you know, I think there's something about then technology that people have and are using themselves. So I absolutely agree with that. I think there's something about how can, how do we describe, so Near Me has a particular um, identity and I think, you know, there's been work done, I think with, with, with the public and, and with staff and it does, it, it, you know, it, 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 it does, um, I think, have a, have a meaning to people. I mean, how do we describe the range of, ways that we're, we're using remote um, consultation interaction interface um, and I think you're right it needs we need to be able to describe that in a way you know demonstrate show it some some way infographically and then also think about how what's our overall branding um, mm -hmm. there is there is a, a view that near me would be a good overall brand and then within that you've got near me video consults you know near me pharmacy you know, near me, primary care, near me, um, you know, I, I, and then you've got, um, I think one of the examples yesterday about wh where you're using some of the online type of messaging services where you're putting in either information or, or videos or, or pictures, you know, is that message me rather than near me, you know. So I think there is something about how do we, but we need to be able to, we need to have a shared understanding of what's, what's in that suite of things um, and how do we set it out and describe it? And I think that's certainly something I've been very conscious of in, 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 in discussion. So I think it is, is, is an area we need to take forward. And we've had some comms support around near me. So I think it's how do we use that to, to um, help us shape how we want to describe the, the, the range of things. Thanks, Margaret. Um, just a couple of quick ones. We're just slightly over our time. Um, Lynn has asked, how do we envisage opportunities for individuals to engage in near me, for example, in villages, etc., where there may be no GP practice? So do we see opportunities for near me hubs? Um, Margaret, is there any thought around that? Yeah, well, I think Highland, uh, well, obviously near me can be operated from people's own homes. Um, so you don't need to go to a GP practice or a clinic to use near me because obviously it's the clinic or the GP practice that's going to be linking in with you. So the issue might be connectivity in people's own homes to be able to do a near me appointment. And certainly in Highland where they had some issues around either people not having a device or um, issues about connectivity, they did have some local hubs that um, you could go to in your in your in your nearby you know you could go and there, there would be a room there that was equipped with near me um that you could then undertake your your your, your appointment um so as i say there's a wider issue about the resilience and um of, of our internet and broadband capability across all of scotland and we know there are some areas where that's still challenging um but uh, there is work in progress um, but as I say, I think in Highland, they have some really good used cases of setting up some of these hubs um, where people can go in and, and do a secure sort of confidential consultation um, where they might not be able to do it from their own home. But it's still within their 
their, their, their local areas. So they're not having to do any long, long travel to, to access. Um, just a final point, uh, Margaret, from Sally. And it relates back to what you were saying previously and also to, I think, to Leslie's point about promoting and sharing the positive feedback that we are receiving from patients and from staff. Um, as part of that, you know, general kind of public awareness, um, because I think quite often if you're on Twitter and if you're in certain email lists and if you're engaged in this topic, you will hear these really good stories about the scale up and engagement and, you know, fantastic uses of a certain technology which have helped people avoid um, travel or other issues that they've had to deal with but we don't necessarily share those messages onwards um, always and that, I think that's a really good point. Yeah no absolutely yeah um, no I, th I think there's still a lot to do you know on that to the comms and engagement and um, and we want to make yeah I think it's about trying to maximize some of the the, the the learning from the last short while and how we we, we, we support that going forward so absolutely um, I think um, all those points are really relevant there because we're a few minutes over our time and um, we do try and finish on time but just to say thanks to everybody for joining thanks especially to Margaret for taking the time out to to think about this and and to you know have an open conversation with us about it um, so hopefully you've found oh leslie's posted a quick comment just to see we hope to hear about the umbrella near me um, that's, that's a good one um, so thanks again to everybody the recording will be made available on the tech website within a few days um, and again we'll be sharing the link um, to so you can share that with your colleagues or even listen again if you wish to thanks margaret and everybody have a good weekend yeah no you too nessa thank you everybody Bye-bye.